and it's headphones nail. Welcome back to Headphones Neil Reviews. I'm your host, as always, Headphones Neil, bringing you a pretty much similar episode to last week as far as reviews go. Um, not too much to say about one episode. Uh, the other one was uh, pretty good um, as far as um, one particular set of events. Um, and then the other stuff is a pretty much updates. I made a couple of progress on the video game. So to start it off, I actually wanted to get um, Star Wars The Acolyte out of the way just because episode 5 was one of those things where it didn't really seem to progress that episode that much um, watching it you kind of, you have essentially a scene with the dark side guy who seems like a knockoff of Kylo Ren and then the light side twin Osha I think yeah Osha um, talking about why she's there uh, learning that the Jedi way is not the only way, not necessarily saying the Sith way is right, but the Jedi, you know, kind of a variation of the Palpatine power speech where the Jedi are afraid of losing their power, but and so they try to protect their only way. So as far as that goes, it was okay, but they didn't really progress the story very much. Um, and then also the Jedi master guy, I guess, figured out that the dark side twin was with him, so he's trying to figure out what's going on instead of going back to Coruscant and then the Jedi on Coruscant are trying to find out what actually happened to that team so I mean stuff happened but it didn't really go very far it seemed like they were prolonging and delaying a lot of stuff in the episode so not too much to say for this week or um, review or acknowledge or anything like that um, the better show for the week though was House of the Dragon season 2 episode 3 The Burning Mill so in this episode, we actually get, um, a, uh, no, I was confused, but Damon going to Heron Hall and retaking it, um, having a meal with the people who are living there, um, and the whole, th and, uh, probably my favorite quote of the thing with, it's a big, it's a big chair with, so or made of swords, so I thought that was particularly funny, so... Uh, when you watch it, I, I just, I don't know, funny, but it was funny, but it was one of those things where I, it was very impactful just because of, um, the way he delivered it, and then, um, I like the ending too, as far as what the, uh, conversation that Rhaenyra and Alicent were having, and I like that they actually came to terms as far as both of them hearing the words of the prince that was promised, and learning that both of them thought of different Aegons. So I'm actually hoping to see that uh, more progression of that, that they talk about it some more, they end the war, or what happens with all of that, just to progress that some more. I thought that was a particularly impactful scene and a good contrast to what Damon was up to, and that everyone is generally um, on board with Damon off doing whatever things he does. So um, a good episode there. I mean. The big for me the big standout part of the episode was the um, the whole sequence through Heron Hall and um, it was very visually done. You have the ghost of Heron Hall like trying to spook and scare Damon, so he's trying to figure that out and what's going on there and all of that stuff. So um, if anything, this episode is um, stand this episode's standout feature is that walkthrough of Heron Hall, and we get to see a lot more of it than we did in. Um, Game of Thrones when Arya is there with Tywin and all of that stuff that happened there so um, definitely worth a watch for that um, and that's really all there is for that um, otherwise I did have a chance to continue playing um, uh, Roller Coaster Tycoon so in this um, for this um, gameplay I played a level called Mel's World another one of those levels where you have to um, um, have enough people in the park and have a good positive park rating. So much like everything else is one of those things where once you I, or I always recommend doing a quick overview to start the game, see what rides are there, see where you can expand the queues and that sort of stuff. Um, 
And then from there, just start building roller coasters, whether they're stock ones or, you know, moderately successful ones. Um, seeing how high of a price you can raise all the roller coasters to. So, you know, push it up to, you know, $5 and then $7 and then $10. And as soon as you start seeing fewer and fewer people riding the ride, then start reducing the price to the point where you see people going on the ride again. So that way you can maximize the pro uh, profits on the ride as well. So you're able to make more money. And this is contrary to what I was doing before where I would price things kind of low so people would always be in line. But you do need to make sure you make money to continue to build rides. So um, when you do things like that, Mel's World is actually a good example of that where um, you can... Um, um, raise the prices and see what uh, make a lot of money and um, essentially um, recoup the money of rides pretty quickly over a few months and then just use things like fast forward use a time fast forward so you can make a lot of your money back and um, that way you're uh, building rides pretty easily and then of course I always default to having a log flume somewhere in the park because that's a pretty easy ride to have people fill up your queue with and make money because if the ride is long enough, people will stay on the ride and um, um, it has a photo section so you make money off of that as well. So, And that's the other thing I'm trying to do more as well is with the rides that have the um, photo option, um, look for a flat point on the ride and add a photo section to it so you can make money on the side that way as well. And then of course the usual tip of starting off the map with um, expanding the food and stalls option and just building extra food options throughout the park and uh, restrooms right off the bat. Um, as far as cleaning the park, I kind of want to say that at this point to um, hold off on hiring people until you um, start seeing the first complaints and then hire a couple of people to go through the park. Um, have maintenance people after a, after you built a few rides, so kind of a four to two basis where if you have four rides, have two maintenance people but then once you're coming to the point where you filled up your park then hire a few more maintenance people start hiring more cleaning people and essentially you're starting to do um um re um, um re oh, crap, now i'm drawing a blank it was a good word too but um you're just kind of um having good customer retention so keeping people in the park keeping people in the lines keeping your park rating up and things like that so you know, as you're, you know, usually two thirds of the way, or at least half of the way through the park um, time counter, that's when you want to start ramping up the number of cleaning people and maintenance people. And a couple of the parks I've seen that security is a um, thing too. So have, a, you know, halfway through the map, have, start hiring security people. You usually don't need too many. So, you know, starting off with one is usually enough. And then once people start complaining about vandalism, hire a couple more. But overall, Mel's World is a good first park as far as um, having a park where you can um, have higher priced rides and make your money back really quickly. So it's super easy to build a ride, make the money back, and then build more rides. So um, the gameplay link or link to the gameplay is in the um, in the show notes, so you can definitely check out the park that I did. Of course, there's many ways to get to it, but. Um, and my part design is probably not the best, but like I said, having long queues is the biggest um, upside to um, the number of guests you want in the park, and along with good pricing and um, um, things like that. So just make sure you have that just going working together so you keep people in the park as long as possible. Um, and then to round out this particular episode, um, I did ha get a chance to play a lot more of Knights of the Old Republic. So after the first part of Andron, um, you do go back to um, Duxin because of the political uprising. So you have a chance to go to the next planet. So for my playthrough, it's the final planet of Korriban. So a couple of things have happened since my last gameplay where I've notably been able to finish the initiating the HK factory side quest. So the thing that I forget for, or forgot about is that when you're on Andra or 
Depending on how early or late you activate the quest with HK47, you do have to make sure you meet up with three groups of HK or three units of HK droids in order to activate the HK factory um, mission later in the game. So on Andron, you actually meet two groups of HK droids. Uh, first, when you first land and go to the marketplace, they're in the very far back right corner of the marketplace. Um, behind where those um, philosopher guys are giving their speech. And then also they show up again when you're getting ready to leave Onderon for the first time after the political uprising, after Kavar, the Jedi Master Kavar runs away. So when you're ready to go back to Duxin, they're over um, back in the, that small square by your ship. So that actually fulfills a second re group unit requirement. And so for this gameplay, I actually hadn't gone to Korriban, so Korriban, there is actually one set of units that shows up there as well when you're going up towards the Shirak Cave and the Academy. So um, in my gameplay, I actually had um, made it um, high, or I had made, activated the quest early enough to the point where I was able to um, beat that, or uh, fight off that third uh, set of HK droids and then talk to HK-47. And he was able to figure out that um, where they're going. And then the biggest thing to make sure is that you initiate the cutscene with HK-47 inter interrogating the other droid to find out the location. Which he'll say that, you know, we need to make sure we go back to Talos. Which ultimately you do have to do when you fight the Ravager. And um, at, at some point you have to find a fight Atrus in the polar region. So... It gives um, HK-47 an opportunity at some point, and I, I forget where now at this point off the top of my head, but it gives him an opportunity to go back to the base, and you end up, I think, just starting off um, in the base or like by the door or some weird place like that, so it's not like it's hard to get there, but the big thing after the third set of HK-4, HK droids that you fight off is for HK-47 to have that interrogation scene. Now I was looking around online and it is an optional thing where you do not necessarily have to have HK-47 in your party in order for him to um, analyze the droid parts and things like that and then to cut, start that in interrogation scene. But I think I'm just used to one of the prior versions of the restored content mod or some, or maybe it's just me being paranoid where um, I always keep or I kept a, I keep HK47 in my party, so that way anytime I um, meet up with the droids, he's there and you know kind of rule out any potential glitches. Not to say that they can't happen, but um, it's one of those things where I want to keep him in the party just to make sure I um, cover all my bases. But regardless, um, I was able to meet up with those droids and, and initiate that quest, so I'll be able to hopefully. Um, initiate that. Um, so as far as now, um, I did uh, finish Korriban, so I met up with Sion and fought him off and ran away. I went to the Shirak cave and learned a little bit more about the past of the character and how he, the character, the exile went off to fight with Revan and all of that. Um, and you know, this more it's kind of like a trip down memory lane and learning, it's kind of like a know yourself kind of um, area with the tomb of Freedom Mad. Um, you get to fight off Revan um, and things like that. Um, and then, of course, with that, once you head back to Onderon, um, you do have to go back to Duxin to uh, listen to the message. And one of the things they want you to do is um, go to go into the jungle to the tomb of Frida and Nad for some reason. Um, I guess to find out what's going on with the mysterious Sith and why they're um, messing with uh, the Onderon with the Onderon people and what kind of deal they are like and the deal with General Vaklu and all that stuff. So one of the tips that I want to say here, and this is of course something that um, assumes you use this mod before you start the game in its entirety is I recommend using the everyone is a Jedi mod because that, so like I said, it starts you off in the beginning of the game with everyone having their force powers. So. Um, of course, you, your character and Kraya start with their force powers already, but it gives Atten his force powers when you get him into your party, and then same thing with Bayodur, the Handmaiden, and the thing I forgot as well in this gift playthrough was that it also gives Mandalore force powers, so um, everyone has their own um, abilities, but essentially, um, 
the handmaiden, Beodor, and Adon are, I think, um, sentinels. And then, um, uh, Mandalor, I think, is uh, either a guardian or a uh, consular. I forget whichever, whichever one is the one that focuses more on combat than for the force. So, um, it's one of those things where you're, where you, the people who are normally supposed to be able to, you're supposed to be able to get force powers with, um, are the Sentinels, because you're not really supposed to get their powers until later in the game at, at various points. So, there, while you can upgrade them throughout the game to get a whole lot of force powers to match what your character has, um, and they're not quite as strong just because they have also their uh, various traits. So, Beodor is still your tech specialist, and Atten is still a scoundrel, and then the Handmaiden is still good in hand-to-hand -hand combat. Um, Mandalore is probably the best one as far as power attacks just because he is supposed to be super strong. So it's one of those things where regardless of who you have in your party, they all have force powers, but this all comes into play because of when you go to the, um, into the ducks and jungle to go to the tomb of Freed and Ned, by using the everyone is a Jedi mod, all of your characters have enough force powers by the time you get to that point in the game if you do Andron and Ducks and later in the game. Um, so when you're going through all of the, you know, the um, jungle area and then you're going into the tomb, your characters are powerful enough to defeat it and it is actually a super smooth and um, straightforward thing to play. Not to say it's hard otherwise um, with the jet Dark Jedi and things like that, but it's also one of those things that you do have to complete that mission because in order to you know defeat the dark side people to finish the Andron quest but it is a very very much so side quest so um it doesn't like the overall story of it um is fine but i would have been nice to have more of that on korriban instead of the ducks and jungle it feels like the ducks and stuff plays well into directly with the Andron story arc Especially when you talk to Mandalore about the Mandalorian Wars and their attack on them, um, going to the other planets to reunite the Mandalore or the Mandalorians, which I would have preferred to have a bigger expansion to keep that separate from the Korriban and Dark Side stuff, um, just because with the Dark Jedi having them on Korriban, um, fighting them and having that there will make some more sense. And then, uh, I mean, they did integrate it okay as far as. Um, explaining that as the his, as part of the history of um, Andron and all of that. But it would have better explained, or be, better fit with stuff in Korriban, why they're there, why this um, academy is still active and all of that, or what's going on with that, or even give a reason to go back into the um, starport and um, find out that they're there or something like that. With the Mandal reuniting the Mandalorians, I actually like that, especially since I figured that out a few years ago, that if, you, that if you talk to them while Mandalore is in your party, you can have them go back to Duxin to join with his, join their clan with his to start reuniting his people. So it actually works out nicely along those th along that front to the point where it would have played well into like a Knights of the Old Republic 3 where his reunited clans go out to find um, Revan or something like that. But... Um, in any case, um, ha and back to, and I know I see keep sidetracking myself, but um, this all goes back to using the everyone as a Jedi mod makes going through all those steps that much better. So regardless of if you use, you know, the characters with force powers or, you know, if you have, you know, Beodor for the mines, and he's really only good, well, he's good early on for the mines and then also for like the computer terminal and re reactivating a droid so you're using minimal parts but then you can also use t3m4 for that and then as far as the attacks go having you know anyone else in your party who's a jedi works so you know Adden, handmaiden and or or a mandalore work but i keep mandalore to take back to Andron, so for in this playthrough, I use Beodor, Atten, and the Handmaiden. But if you want, you know, different, you you want, you know, maybe a ranged character or more variety in your crew, then you can take, you know, for example, HK forty seven, T three M four, and anyone else. So Beodor kind of becomes redundant if you have T three M four. So if you take Atten or the Handmaiden, then you have a Jedi with force powers for a close combat, HK forty seven and T3M4 for ranged combat, and then T3M4 for the computer systems and the 
um, droids and all that technology stuff. So, and and this is all kind of overthinking it as well. There's not that much going on. You have the two terminals in the tomb on the left and right to deal with, but that's more logic puzzles than anything else. And then um, the droid and things like that. So even if you don't have the um, repair ability for the droid um, or the computer abilities to have the um, the droid and the sentients fight each other at the entrance of the tomb. Um, it's not really a necessity to do any of that, but it does make all of that stuff a little bit easier and give you access to the experience points. So that's kind of why for that part, having you know a tech specialist like Beodor or T3M4 definitely helps out. So that's all there is for this particular episode. So that was probably a little bit longer. This or this was probably a little bit longer than I was expecting to review. But um, with Knights of the Old Republic, I am now on my way to heading towards the end game of the game. So um, coming up will be the gameplay for um, Andron. So the defeating. Um, um, Kavar and uh, giving Vakalu the throne so that'll be another gameplay and then I think after that um, I think it's the Ravager after that with Dar Mihilus so you have to defeat him get rid of him and then once you defeat him you go to Malachor and deal with all of that so that's a super long end game to the ending of the game and all that but um, and for some reason I keep feeling like I'm now missing things, especially since I forgot about the Tomb of Frida Nan. But um, with that being said, um, the tomb, or I think the end game, once you get to this point, is pretty much straightforward. There's not a whole lot. Of, oh, actually, no, there is a couple of things in between. So once you finish with Andron, there is a Ravager and Malachor. But before that, there is, you know, going to the um, polar region to fight with um, Atris, I believe. Um, going back to um, the Tilo station to um, fight off the um, battle that's going on there before I think that's all I think before you get to the Ravager because you have to defeat them to get and Mandalore takes some, some of his the Mandalorians to plant bombs on the um, sh on the Ravager so um, there's a couple of cross connecting things and then of course in the middle of all that um, HK-47 goes to the HK factory so there are a few things going on but there's not um, as far as overarching story goes there's not much else I think at some point you do go back to Dantooine as well to get your final force power I think I already have force crush but I think that force choke or something gets expanded into its final form for dark side users I think light side users get force enlightenment, so you have a single button to um, activate. I think it's force speed, force valor, and force aura or something like that. There are like three different force powers that you can activate with one click. So um, there's all that. So look forward to all of that coming soon. And then of course the usual weekly gameplay for um, um, Roller Coaster Tycoon. So we have more of the or my current plan is to take care of all the maps that have the guest minimum guest requirements like you know have so many guests in your park with a certain park rating and if that doesn't unlock enough of the you know rest of the maps then i'll have to go back and do the other levels where you have to do things like have certain park ratings or see if i can download um completed or successful maps and copy them over to see if i can get around them and move into roller coaster tycoon 2 maps which, now that I'm thinking about it, might be something to consider. Um, it's one of those things where I played a lot of Roller Coaster Tycoon 1 now, where I do want to get into Roller Coaster Tycoon 2, so I do want to unlock some of those maps, but not necessarily have to play every single level in the first game. So, which I know is cheating and kind of a tricky hack way of getting through it, but um, yeah, I, I, at some point you do want to move into the new level, so that's one of those things to look up as well. But um, that's neither here nor there. Regardless, I'm still going to be playing those levels, so look out for those as well. Continued reviews for House of the Dragon and the Alkalite until those finish, um, and all of that good stuff. But, as always, you can check out the gameplay videos and all of that on the YouTube channel at youtube.com slash pateln01. The website is headphonesneal.reviews for past episodes, subscription links, supporting the show, and all of that good stuff. 
along with a link to the Patreon, which is also patreon.com slash PatelN01, where you can usually get early access to the podcast, a link to the YouTube version, an ad-free version of the episode, and all of that good stuff ahead of the normal, regular public um, feed for the show. And I say usually because in this case, because it's for this 4th of July holiday, for the day off and all of that, I thought I'd do something different and a little bit special where I push it all out, all at the same time, all on the same day, so everyone gets access to the gets access to the show the way they way you usually do it, so or get it. So whether it's the public RSS feed for audio, um, YouTube, or on Patreon, um, it's all going to be out there so you, everyone can see, uh, or you can all you can get access to it early. So um, definitely check that out and thank you in advance for supporting the show, subscribing, listening, tuning in and all of that good stuff. But that's all there is for this particular episode. Thanks for tuning in.